soil moisture meters for better golf turf. You know, these tools have grown tremendously over the past few years, and because the superintendent's not have the ability to accurately and quickly assess soil moisture content much better than ever before. How many in the audience make regular irrigation decisions based off of moisture meters? A couple. All right, talk to those guys. Oh, more. Okay, I'll, I'll do a little bit more. All right. Biggest benefit for moisture meters is water conservation, no question. Um, we can reduce our water use on golf courses by having a better understanding of just how much water is in our soils at this given point. Uh, I won't go too much further into that, but from a regional basis, Northeast really doesn't use that much water compared to other areas like the Southwest and, and the desert parts of the country, but that doesn't mean uh, water conservation isn't still important to us. Um, you know, we just talked about some of the regulations and you know, ongoing issues with this. Water is going to continue to be a hot button issue uh, over the next few years. And the water conservation pays off, certainly more so for some courses than others if you're paying for water. Um, so everyone's going to benefit both from an environmental standpoint and from an economical standpoint to use less water on their golf courses. And again, that's regionally dependent based on who pays for water uh, and how much that water costs are. You look at this graph and you see the Southwest, it's not uncommon for a few courses in Las Vegas area to pay over a million dollars in water fees on an annual basis. And that's pretty important, especially when you break it down across the entire region, or the entire country for that matter, where almost half the facilities pay for water. In the Northeast, that's a little bit lower uh, than almost half, but across the country, that's where these tools really have a fair amount of benefit. And at some point, we're forced into these water regulations, whether it's uh, mandatory regulations or self-imposed regulations, because we're just running out of our own water source that we have due to drought conditions. Uh, and this is all too real. We saw this in 2010 at a number of courses in Connecticut. This uh, superintendent told me to go to Google Earth to check out how bad his course looked like uh, because of the drought. He was forced to really cut back his water use by almost 50%. So this can happen to anyone at any given time and given you know, we've, we've uh, talked about drainage, now's the time for a drought. So the reason why these tools are so beneficial is because they really reduce the subjectivity that's associated with the traditional techniques of looking at the turf and looking at the soil. And that's going to be a consistent program that you're still going to do in your golf courses, but moisture meters really allow you to take that subjectivity and turn it into an objective value, a percent moisture uh, that you can you know, make much better irrigation decisions based off of that value. As a result, you can have better playability. Again, we talked about it earlier. Generally, drier turf is better for golf from an economic standpoint and usually better from a playability standpoint. Um, you help eliminate or reduce employee errors from underwater turf, which is what's going on here, or the opposite scenario, frequently overwater turf and, and all the problems that are associated with that. That's actually a bigger issue, I think, in our region. Uh, that underwater turf in a lot of situations. Uh, I'll skip over that slide. Again, more about the value of moisture meters. They can help you detect deficiencies with your automatic irrigation system, really pinpoint some drainage problems, why certain areas just aren't drying out, help you predict wilt, daily moisture loss, and they're a good training tool for employees that you might be putting on your hand watering crew. Uh, again, I touched on this earlier though, they don't eliminate those traditional techniques that we've been using for the past uh, you know, 200 years of, of greenkeeping. We're still going to look at the turf and look at the soil, but over time, we're going to be able to make better decisions because we have a better predictor of how much moisture is in the soil. So how do they work? A lot of different manufacturers, they all work through the same technology, so uh, it doesn't really matter a whole heck of a lot. The point being is that they can work in a wide range of soils from sand-based putting greens to really heavily clay textured fairways and everything in between, so they're really pretty accurate. Um, I don't want to scare some folks in here. Uh, they're very user friendly. Generally, uh, throughout the entire country, our aptitude for technology is, is through the roof. Um, you know, these are not my kids. I don't have any kids, which is, if that's what they were up to, that'd be kind of scary to begin with. But the point being is that these tools are very user friendly. They're not overly complex. Between myself, Dave, and Jim, and the rest of the green section staff, we visited superintendents of all age ranges and advancements in technology. Uh, they've all been able to have success with them when used appropriately. Again, a lot of different options to choose from uh, that are out there that all can work really well for your situation. It is important, however, to know how to use them. They're almost too easy in one, in one sense where 
use them a little bit too frequently or too quickly, I should say, and you might see some discrepancies within those readings which can impact what kind of irrigation decisions I can make. First and foremost is selecting the right probe or rod lengths for your situation. The key really is to measure soil moisture where the bulkier root mass is, and most of the audience have pollinia green, so the root mass is anywhere from three inches, maybe four inches uh, in the spring, all the way down to a half inch in the summer. So a shell or probe in the summer is probably gonna give you a better idea. Uh, it'd be great to have multiple sets of probe lengths out there though to you know, predict what moisture is in the spring where the bulky root mass is gonna be located. Um, when you start using these though, the, the first things that you need to really work on is just building your own database. I don't know anyone that just buys a moisture meter and instantly starts making irrigation decisions based off of, you know, just taking a few readings here or there. It takes time, a period of weeks, maybe even months of using this tool and comparing it with your traditional techniques. But basically, you start taking measurements, you're looking at the percent volumetric moisture content that this tool is showing you, and compare it with what you traditionally like to see. Are the greens, you know, too wet or too dry? And you start figuring out those moisture ranges and you're building your own database uh, from there. Again, it's got to be your own database, though. Um, it's a small group in here that you know everyone is uh, pretty close together, and, and we're all talking about a lot of the same things. You start hearing different courses, numbers. Don't pay attention to that. It's got to be your own database because the variability between soils can be so dramatic that it really doesn't matter what types of moisture levels one course has that might be next door. Uh, you got to build your own database there. Proper use is really important. This is something that I've seen, especially actually we, we've seen this in championships where we use these tools fairly regularly. Uh, making sure that the rods are pushed all the way in the turf uh, and not having any of those rods exposed to the air, that can skew the number of readings. Um, and then ultimately, the more readings you take per your, you know, the green or the tee or wherever you're looking at, the better value you're gonna have. It's just like a, a survey. The more people you, you look into, the more answers you're gonna get and the more accurate description. Uh, so collecting the data and using in the field, I'll provide two quick examples. Ultimately, you can use these tools however best work for you. There isn't one single right program out there, but I just wanted to share two examples. Uh, the first is Sean Kane at Sunningdale, and he really has had success with this program. What he does, he takes measurements first thing in the morning and basically then transposes that information onto a color-coded map. So if the quadrant is that he measures, let's say, is that, you know, got a volumetric moisture content of over 18%. He's found with his developing his database that that will need the water. So we're going to color that quadrant blue. The quadrant right next to it might be, you know, a little bit drier, somewhere between 12 and 16%. That portion gets colored yellow. That tells his hand watering crew we need a little bit of water there. <laughs> and then if he finds another quadrant that's really dry, less than 12% moisture, let's say, he colors that red, and that's a cue for his hand watering crew that. All right, this, this area is burning up. We need to apply a lot more water to these zones. And he's really found success in these areas uh, to eliminate both overwatering and underwatering in different parts of the golf course. So a really quick, simple uh, tool that's pretty creative that, that uh, again, has worked really well for him. Uh, Todd Rash at Ridgewood is another uh, good example of how to use it. Basically what Todd does is he, he takes measurements in the morning and then he has his hand watering crew follow up from there he tries to bring the moisture levels in the greens to a uniform amount. And he's got a range of 19 to 22%, which again, doesn't mean anything for anyone in the room. But the point is, it's a range. And he's found over time, building his database, that that's an appropriate range for his golf course for his pole greens to make it through the day with only needing some sort of hand syringe cycles here or there. Um, then from there, you can really get detailed uh, with data tracking and, and predicting some of these things here or there that uh, some companies have this information out there, this type of software. Uh, it's not necessary, but it's another tool that more of these are sure to hit the market. Again, you're trying to avoid this type of scenario. At this point, it's kind of too late. Uh, final considerations with moisture meters is that they do have an impact on the playability of the greens if they're used too aggressively, um, particularly if users are really jamming into the turf or pulling onto the turf too aggressively, they can cause these really small little tufts on the greens that look identical to spike mark damage. And I know everyone in here knows the rules of golf, so you, you cannot repair damage from spike marks, but you can repair damage caused by a moisture meter because that's something that's caused by the greenkeeper. Uh, the issue is they look the same, so how do you know which one is which? 
Um, so employees should be careful when taking these measurements, tamp down any tufts that they might create if they're a little too aggressive. And, and oftentimes, you don't really see them if, if the employees are kind of gentle. Um, again, they're predominantly used for green so far, but their use is expanding into other areas on the golf course, approaches, and tees, things like that. Uh, really, the beauty part is that moisture meters are not all that expensive. Considering the benefits they have and the cost savings potential that they have, and the environmental benefits that they have, you know, twelve hundred dollars is is really a pain break in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it'd be great to try them out before you buy them, but if you use them appropriately and use them often, they're going to work really well for your golf course and your situation. So, uh, with that, I guess so. We'll wrap it up.